This is Talking Foreign Policy, a critical look at Canada's role abroad, and I'm Eve Engler. Today, the International Criminal Court Chief Prosecutor Karim Khan announced that he was seeking uh, warrants, applied for warrants uh, for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Defense Minister uh, Gallant, and um, uh, Hamas's leader in Gaza, uh, Hamas's political leader, and uh, military leader. Canada has opposed uh, previous efforts to uh, investigate Israeli war crimes uh, at the International Criminal Court, specifically four years ago, the Canadian government opposed, uh, sent a letter to the ICC dissuading them uh, from investigating Israeli war crimes and implied that Canada might cut off its um, funding to the ICC uh, if it pursued uh, Israel. Um, and uh, But the Canadian government committed two months ago to um, respecting the ICC's uh, investigation of, of Israel's uh, uh, possible war crimes. To discuss this ICC uh, move, uh, we have uh, Dimitri Lascaris, well-known uh, Canadian lawyer and activist. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, coming on. Thank you, Aliv. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And um, so, yeah, what's your reaction to uh, this uh, move from the chief prosecutor of the ICC today? I am massively unimpressed. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, in fact, I think it's disgraceful, to be perfectly blunt about it. I'd like to spend a few minutes, if I may, uh, parsing the statement that this so-called prosecutor, Kareem Khan, QC, made. just so you know what QC means in the British legal system, it's a distinction, it means Queen's Counsel, and it's meant for the more esteemed members of the bar. Uh, if, in fact, this QC and designation means anything, it should be withdrawn from Green Khan, to be perfectly blunt about it. But let me get into the meat of the announcement. So he puts out a statement today, and it starts with, I am filing applications for warrants of arrest before pretrial, pretrial chamber number one of the International Criminal Court in the situation in the state of Palestine. And then you can find this on his Twitter feed and his website. Then there's this picture. So one of these you know, pictures lawyers, litigators like to put out where they're standing before a podium and they've got their hands crossed, and they look stern. And on either side of him, he has another prosecutor standing there looking almost like an FBI agent, hands crossed. I mean, it's it's all very stylized, very ceremonial, but doesn't mount to a hill of beans. So we get into the meat of the, the announcement. The very first thing he says is he is seeking arrest warrants for three Hamas officials. Not It's not Israel, that's not the headline. The headline is three Hamas officials, one of whom is Ismail Hanaya, who is a political director. He's not in Gaza. He's not a military commander. And he's, in fact, been carefully involved in negotiations to try to bring this horror to an end. You know, subjecting this man to an arrest warrant is going to complicate his ability to do his job because he has to shuttle around the Middle East, you know, and meet with people in order to try to negotiate a ceasefire. And he's not a military commander, but for some reason... You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Khan decided to include him in this indictment. So then he goes on and he says, I have reasonable grounds to believe that these three individuals have done uh, a number of war crimes. And he lists eight of them. Uh, and one of them is extermination is a crime against humanity. Murder is a crime against humanity. He includes rape and other acts of sexual violence, although there are very serious questions around Israel's allegations of mass systemic rape. Uh, he alleges torture against uh, uh, Hamas in the context of captivity. Um, and then uh, and the last one is outrages upon personal dignity as a war crime. So eight war crimes. Um, and then he goes on and he talks about how much he appreciates the cooperation he got from Israelis and uh, family members of the victims and so forth. And OK, fine. Uh, and uh, he uses very uh, inflammatory language to describe what Hamas did. And then he gets to Israel. And uh, there he reveals that he's only going to prosecute two people, uh, not three, as in the case of Hamas, the Prime Minister Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant Defense Minister. And by the way, these two people are probably finished politically when this war is over, uh, because they were the ones who were in charge of Israeli security on October 7th, and because uh, one of them, Benjamin Netanyahu, is extremely corrupt and should be in jail for a whole range of things, including corruption. So he's 
pick the two people who really have no future after this war in Canadian politics, I'm sorry, in Israeli politics, and instead of eight war crimes, he alleges seven, okay, they do not include genocide. Now, let's recall two things. He says that he is acting on the basis of reasonable grounds. He has reasonable grounds to believe that these uh, indictees, these accused, did certain things. On January 26th of this year, the International Court of Justice rendered a decision in which every single Western judge, including the then president of the court, who was a former official in the Obama State Department, that it was plausible that Israel is committing genocide. What does plausible mean? Plausible means you have reasonable grounds to allege it. So just by virtue of the fact that the ICJ, the highest court in the United Nations system, held it was plausible that Israel is committing genocide means that Mr. QC, Kareem Khan, has reasonable grounds to believe that Israel is committing genocide. He doesn't even have to do the additional work to build up a body of evidence. South Africa has already done that for him. The ICJ has already done that for him, at least for purposes of you know seeking an arrest warrant and lodging an indictment, but no allegation of genocide. He also starts his recitation of the seven war crimes he's alleging by making very clear that he's limiting himself to the Gaza Strip and the events from October 8th onwards. What does this mean, Eve? This means forget about apartheid, which doesn't appear anywhere in here, and Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, B'Tselem, Yeshtin, two Israeli human rights organizations, a whole slew of UN special rapporteurs have all said Israel is committing apartheid. It's a slam dunk. That's off the table. Genocide is off the table. What, has, what else is off the table? The settlements in the West Bank, because he's limiting it to the Gaza Strip. And that is also a slam dunk. There's no question that the settlements violate a, a, constitute a war crime and a violation of international law. In fact, even Canada's government admits this. And um, frankly, the ICC should have uh, prosecuted Israel for that particular war crime 20 years ago. It's inconceivable. Uh, uh, that There's no possible justification for it's not having done so up until this very day. And now we're told today that that too is off the table, the settlements, which have expanded relentlessly during the genocide that we are now witnessing. So in my opinion, Eve, what is going on here is that it got to a point where Khan, he waited seven months for this genocide to unfold. Israel alleges that Hamas killed 36 children, two toddlers, not 40 beheaded babies. There's no evidence of that. That was a complete fabrication. Two toddlers, 36 children on October 7th. Israel has killed over 15,000 Palestinian children now, and the number may be well higher when we include the children who are buried under the rubble. And he is telling us that effectively how this is framed is Hamas is the bigger criminal, and Hamas started this whole thing. He's erasing from the record decades of barbaric uh, oppression of the Palestinian people, which clearly any fair-minded, sane person can see, provoked violence from various factions within Israeli society. It was a uh, Palestinian society. This was an, an inevitable consequence of Israel's decades-long barbarism and impunity. So I think he's simply doing the bare minimum. This is window dressing. I doubt very much that without intense pressure, he's going to actually vigorous, vigorously prosecute Netanyahu and uh, Gallant. And I have to say to our comrades in the Palestinian solidarity community, please stop celebrating it, celebrating the crumbs that people like Kareem Khan occasionally toss at the Palestinian people, because these are crumbs. This is nothing to celebrate. We should be condemning unequivocally every day this joke of a prosecutor for this disgraceful announcement that he made today. So, so um, okay, then I guess the couple of questions come out of that. One is the why question. We know that the there was some U.S. Congress people that sent a letter uh, to him three weeks ago, a month ago, and talk about prosecution came up, and they were they were threatening even his like children if they ever wanted to have visas to the U.S. that. They would cut that off and threatens threats to him. We know that the U.S. made all kinds of threats to the ICC over the years. As I mentioned previously, the Canadian government four years ago um, sort of implied it would cut off its funding to the ICC if, if investigation of Israel. Um, we know that uh, about a year ago, Karim Khan was in Ottawa for an event 
with the uh, Raoul Wallenberg Center, which is the uh, Erwin Kotler's uh, organization, which at the time I thought this was obviously, first of all, it was a bad sign that he would participate in this event put on by Kotler's organization and also that Kotler's intent in, in hosting this event was to try to, you know, like work him to not, not uh, investigate Israel's, uh, Israel's crimes. And this is of, of all before October 7th. So, so I assume that that's uh, part of, of the, um, yeah. So what, I guess, Quentin, what's your reaction to that uh, question, first of all? Well, he's a Brit and he was a British prosecutor. He's a QC, as I mentioned, which means that he is firmly ensconced in the British legal elite and they approve of him. And all you need to know about Kareem Khan, I mean, quite apart from his QC designation and what all that signifies to those of us who actually understand what these symbols mean. The main thing you need to know is that he was promoted relentlessly for the position by the British government. I think the prime minister at the time was Boris Johnson. So, I mean, give me a break. If that's the case, they know that this is somebody, that's, this is their man. This is their man at the Hague. They know he's ideologically aligned with them. They know he is, uh, that he can be uh, compromised, that he is morally compromised, that he's one of them. So that's why they promoted him. I don't even think it was necessary, frankly, for the U.S. government to, you know, issue all of these psychopathic threats against the ICC and its prosecutors, because he's one of them. That's why he got the job, Eve. But on, on top of that, they did throw in a few additional, you know, warnings after he became the prosecutor, just to make sure that he was going to stay in line. And although the, you know, the, the Israel lobby is going berserk, as usual, claiming that this is an outrage, in fact, they should be kissing the shoes of Kareem Khan, because the man actually did the absolute bare minimum that he could, given the position that he's in. Seven months of genocide, no end in sight. The decision of the ICJ, huge pressure coming from the international uh, community of jurists. He had to do something. He did the bare minimum. And I don't think this man is serious about prosecuting either Netanyahu or Gilant. So frankly, the people in the Israel lobby who are complaining bitterly about this, they're just full of nonsense. This is actually a tremendous favor that he has done to the apartheid genocidal regime. And so what's going to be the next step here uh, legally? This is going to, I assume, play out for a long time. Absolutely. You know, the prosecution, uh, in a, in, and particularly international uh, uh, litigation, uh, it can have an enormous influence over the pace at which these things are prosecuted. If Kareem Khan and anybody who succeeds to his position wants to drag this out until Netanyahu is dead, uh, then they can't. Or until Netanyahu is actually sitting and festering in an Israeli jail, then he can't. And I think that's exactly, exactly what we should expect. He's not going to pursue this vigorously as, I mean, it, all, all you need to know in order to understand that is that the man could have indicted uh, Israel the day he came to office, Netanyahu and Gilant and all these other characters for the war crime of promoting settlements in the West Bank. He's not done anything up until about that until this very day. He waited four months after the ICJ rendered its decision on January 26th. It's been almost four months. This man has absolutely, he's going to move this prosecu prosecution forward at a glacial pace unless we put unrelenting, intense pressure on him. And so I guess also, what do you, how do you think this plays out politically in Canada? So far, I, I can't, I'm not seeing anything from Melanie Jolie. So she hasn't said anything one way or another on her, on her Twitter account. I, a quick search I couldn't find, didn't seem like there's any other comment. We're now, uh, I guess, about uh, eight or 10 hours ago where this, this was uh, all announced. So they definitely have had time to, to, uh, to see the news. Um, Yes. Yeah, so what's your sense on how this uh, uh, plays politically in Canada? Or, I mean, has have we seen any reaction really from uh, the Biden administration? Either? I have not seen. I, I've been busy today paying attention to uh, other matters, including the uh, uh, the death of uh, the Iranian president and the foreign minister. So I haven't had time to really closely monitor what the governments of the West are saying in response to this. Uh, what I will say is this, uh, in terms of the response of the Trudeau government, I think they're in a real bind, not because they particularly care about the ICC or the brutalization and 
obliteration of the Palestinian people. If they cared about that, they would have sanctioned Israel a long time ago. Uh, they've done absolutely nothing. Everything they've done is pure rhetoric, meaningful, meaningless kabuki theater. But their problem is that they have a base that is increasingly sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. And this has been indicated by polls. You see people who are Liberal Party supporters are becoming very upset about this situation. The ICJ's decision already put them in a bind. Now this is going to put them in a philosophical rhetoric. And like the Biden administration, although they have a little more time than Biden, they are facing uh, an election in the not too distant future and their opponent is ahead of them in the polls, Poilievre. So they have a difficult political uh, you know, line to walk, a very fine, delicate political line to walk. Don't send you know, their Zionist supporters like the Bronfmans and all these other liberal party supporters who are very, very committed to the Zionist project. Uh, don't alienate them so much that they lose their support. Uh, but at the same time, say and do what you can by way of you know, empty rhetoric in order to placate uh, the many uh, people within the Liberal Party base who are becoming very upset about this. At the end of the day, Eve, I believe that the Trudeau government, I think it's absolutely crystal clear, is not going to change its policies meaningfully and for the better towards Palestinians until they get the green light from the Biden administration. And my advice to my comrades in the Palestinian Solidarity Movement in Canada, frankly, I'm sorry to say this, but this is the conclusion I've come to after seven months of blatant genocide, is uh, you'd be better off getting on buses and going down to the United States and joining our American comrades and putting pressure on the Biden administration to bring an end to this genocide, because frankly, that is what is going to determine Canadian government policy. That's, that's my best sense of what's going on in Canada. I can't imagine that the Trudeau government will have the moral courage to part company with Biden on this particular issue. And I, I would love to be proven wrong. I really would. I myself, as you know, participated in many protests. Uh, when I was in uh, Montreal recently, Toronto, London, I gave speeches at these protests. I'm, you know, tremendously supportive of the students who are on university campuses all across Canada. I admire their courage. I commend their moral integrity. Uh, but I just don't see any indication that the Canadian government is willing to part company with the Biden administration on this issue. Well, uh, thanks for breaking down the um, what appears is is, is um, a real sellout <laughs> from uh, from the ICC, which which is probably shouldn't be surprising. Um, but uh, it's important to know that um, you know this is just fits within the broader pattern of the U.S., U.K., Canada. Uh, uh, enabling of of Israeli uh, crimes, even when we're supposedly prosecuting those crimes, we're still effectively enabling them. Um, so thanks a lot for coming on to uh, talking uh, foreign policy, Dimitri. Thank you. Good talking to you.